But you say, how have you loved us? And you can pause right there. Let me tell you a little about Malachi, and then we're going to jump in and study this passage, really the first five verses together. Some quick facts about Malachi. Malachi, or Malach, E, E is that pronominal suffix that you add. It's a possessive suffix. So Malach means messenger. You add that little sound at the end, the E sound at the end, and it means my messenger. Uh, some people have said because his title or his name is my messenger that perhaps he's taking on a, a title that was not actually his name. Uh, that's certainly possible. Uh, that was done at, in some places, but usually not with prophets' names. So uh, most scholars believe that was indeed his actual name, Malachi. And Malachi preached about 20 or 30 years after Zechariah completed his ministry. You remember Zechariah's ministry spanned several decades, but what we have in the book of Zechariah, or sort of, sort of the beginning of his ministry and probably toward the end of his ministry, and there's a gap in between, if you remember from our study of Zechariah. About 60 years after the temple was finished, Malachi was preaching. What had happened is that the people in Malachi's time became what some people call the Old Testament church of Laodicea. They became lukewarm. These people started getting cold. They heard all these prophecies from the generation before. In fact, many of the parents and grandparents would have been around during Zechariah and Haggai's time and would have been motivated. And They built a temple, and here they are, 30, 40 maybe years later, and nothing really dramatic has happened. And so the people began to get cold. And so I wrote down three things. The people had grown cynical. They read the promises of God. They read the the prophecies recorded from Zechariah. They repeated these things. Maybe some of the more faithful of the prophets were reteaching these things to the people, and the people heard these things and got kind of cynical. When are all these promises going to come true? And you remember the promises there. We we ended with an end times promise there in chapter 14 last week. And people began to be cynical about this. Why hadn't God done all this? When is this going to all happen? I mean, we got our hopes all up. We got all excited. We built this temple, and we've been sitting here for a couple decades. The people had also grown careless in worship. Now, God gives us commands of how to worship Him. I told the early Sunday school class, that it wasn't very long ago, some person, one of my wife's friends on Facebook or another, so I can't remember social media, but she, she said something like this, um, I was so glad my pastor preached a sermon about how it doesn't matter how you worship God as long as you worship Him. That ought to make, make an eyebrow go up. What? You ever heard of Nadab and Abihu who brought strange fire to the Lord? Have you ever heard of Uzzah? He had all the right sincere intentions. He just wasn't worshiping God, carrying the Ark of the Covenant like God had commanded. God is very concerned about how we worship Him. He has desires. Now, it's not, we don't go, go into you know, Sunday morning all panicked if we're going to do it wrongly. But especially, you trust the leadership, you trust the church, you, you look forward, you ask questions, you think about what does the Bible say about how I worship God. God cares that we worship Him theologically properly. It's not just all about your sentiment. I I think this is probably one of the most negative things about a lot of the modern hymns, and I would say probably not just the modern ones. Jonathan and I have looked at old hymns from the 50s and (laughs) even earlier, and some of these things are just silly. They haven't thought about what the Bible says about who God is. God wants us to worship Him in spirit and in truth. We need to worship Him theologically correctly. We, there, is, there are confines to the way we worship Him. Well, especially for the people of Israel, living in the Old Covenant, there were confines. They had to worship Him. They had to make sacrifices a certain way. And what we're going to find out is they were bringing not their best to God, not the spotless lambs who were to represent Jesus Christ. They were bringing the ones that they, they were going to kill anyway. They are going to get rid of anyway the lame ones, the broken ones, the ones that they didn't care about, they had gotten very careless. And of course, this led to 
a third part, a third description of the people of Israel in that time, they had grown carnal. If it's all the same, if God's not going to come and redeem his people and fulfill all these promises and do all this, why even try? Here we are trying to be holy. Here we are trying to go through all these processes. Here we are trying to worship God. Why, do, should, we, why should we even try anymore? All of us, maybe not now, but all of us probably have been in temptation where we've thought that thought. Why am I taking such efforts to be holy and to do what's right? It'd be so much easier... And it doesn't seem like there's a lot of payoff, maybe immediate payoff, to doing what's right. Like the payoff seems to be doing what's wrong. And so maybe we have this kind of attitude that the people did in the time of Malachi. They grew carnal. They didn't themselves become pagans, but they began to invite paganism, and they began to invite just this carnality, this way of living into their lives. And so God sent a prophet, Malachi, to come preach to the people. Now, Malachi started his prophecy of the people in a strange way, in a very strange way. Malachi began preaching to the people of Israel by preaching about the doctrine of election. I can already tell some of you are getting a little nervous, palms are getting sweaty. I'm always reminded what R.C. Sproul said about preaching the doctrine of predestination or election, he said, uh, you know, you need to be very careful. You need to take, take it easy. Don't, don't uh, just pound the people with this. You need to be, speak very kindly, very warmly. Make sure they understand you're not denying uh, evangelism. You're not denying the love of God or prayer or the, the necessity of faith and repentance. And, and you need to be careful with this. And, and I just want you to know something. It won't work. People will still get mad at you if you just mention it. It stirs people up. A few weeks ago, there was a gentleman uh, who was visiting from California, from Thousand Oaks, and actually lives in Simi Valley, and he was sitting about halfway back on the right, right in the aisle, and uh, I got up uh, to make the announcements. I was making the announcements that Sunday, and uh, I recognized him. I probably haven't seen him since I was like a senior in high school, so like five years ago. And uh, he, was, he was sitting back there, and his name's Tim. I said, Tim, oh my goodness, you know. Well, the thing I remember about Tim, and I told him this. He's a few years older than me. I think he's like 50 now. And I told Tim, I said, Tim, the thing that I remember about you is I was like a senior in high school. You were in college, and you came, or maybe I think you went to med school or something. I said, you came to me one Sunday on a Sunday morning in church, in my dad's church, and you had your Bible open to Romans chapter 9, and you read to me these verses about Esau being hated and Jacob being loved and God choosing people for salvation and vessels for destruction. And I remember, I mean, this, just, this just took me down a wormhole for about three years. This bothered me so much. And I remember what I told Tim at that point. I said, Tim, I remember telling you, like, there's no way. This must not mean what it seems like it means. Surely there's a way to wriggle free from what this sounds like it's saying. Surely we have, and <clears throat> my words, or surely we have free will. Surely God does not sovereign. Surely he, he, you know, whatever the case, maybe he looks forward in time and somehow calculates what he's going to do and make his plans based on what we're going to do in the future. Or something. Surely there's some way to wriggle free from this. And I asked him that the other day, and he said, uh, he said, actually, what's funny is I didn't know either. I was asking, you were the pastor's son. I was asking you to give, give an explanation to me. He said, I was down the wormhole already. You were just right behind me. So for several years, and really it sort of climaxed, there was a time in college a couple years later, where I just wrestled and wrestled and wrestled with this. The doctrine of election is not so, so much that it's hard to understand the idea of God choosing people for salvation. That's, that's pretty easy to comprehend. It's hard to accept. I think I put that on your notes here. Doctrine of election. Doctrine of election is not so much hard to understand. It is hard to accept. It's hard to accept this. And I think it's hard to accept for good reasons, because there are passages about us choosing God. 
and witnessing to people and praying and repenting. And if God wants us to do this, if, if that's what we're supposed to do in order to get the gospel around, in order for people to be saved, that's what we're supposed to do. How can at the same time God be sovereign and choose people for salvation? How does this work? And, and so what we try to do a lot of times is we try to, to logic our way through this. You have sort of two extremes uh, historically speaking, two extremes of people who have tried to sort of logic their way through this apparent contradiction in Scripture. One group of people sort of stick with all the passages that talk about God's sovereignty, and they ignore all the passages about man's responsibility. These, this was a movement in the 1800s called the hyper-Calvinist movement. Now, this is not to be confused with Calvinists who are hyper, and we're all aware of all these people who love to talk about predestination every moment they get a chance. We're all annoyed by these people. We understand, we understand there, are hype, there are Calvinists who are hyper. This is an actual movement called hyper-Calvinism. These are people who did not believe in any evangelism, in any missions. In fact, it was called also the anti-missions movement. They did not believe that someone even needed to pray a sinner's prayer. They did not believe that someone even needed to repent. They just said, if you're chosen, you don't have to do anything. You just stand listlessly by, and you do nothing. God is so sovereign. And they ignored all the passages about God's means of grace and the way God gets the gospel out and saves his children and about human responsibility. They ignore all those passages. On the other end of the spectrum are the Pelagians and the semi-Pelagians. You may know them as Arminians, Arminianism, not Armenians, which is a country, Armenia. Arminianism is named after a guy named Jacobus Arminius who came along and looked at these things and put the emphasis and sort of ignored the passages of God's sovereignty and put the focus on the passages about man's responsibility. Most of us, not all of us, but most of us grew up, if you grew up an evangelical Christian, you grew up in that world. You didn't ever hear about God's sovereignty. It is why it sort of took me by surprise about this shock of, wait, this is in the Bible? I, I think I even did this. I looked at that and I, wait, is this the Bible? Where'd you, where are you getting this? This is not the God that I love and serve. He leaves it up to me. It's all about me and my choice. Well, suffice it to say, we cannot... Oh, by the way, I put this up here for you. I keep on forgetting to do these points for you. We can't logic this out. There is a rationale to it. And in the end, you will find it. If you submit to the truth of Scripture, you will find it to be the most logical, rational way of thinking. However, if at first glance you try to logic your way out of it and wriggle free, you will end up on one of these, on one of these extremes. And you don't want to be there. You just want to believe what Scripture says plainly. This is what Malachi begins his prophecy with. The doctrine of the fact that God chose the people of Israel and did not choose their genetic kin, the Edomites. Jacob and Esau had the same DNA. They did not one he chose and one he did not choose, and it had nothing to do with what Jacob and Esau did in the future. It was wholly reliant on the grace of God. Now again, if you read Scripture, what you will find is that does not mean there is no, we have no responsibility, and we just stand listlessly like the hyper-Calvinists would say, and we just sort of wait for God to do what he wants to do. We have a responsibility to respond, to repent, to have faith. But when you respond in repentance and faith, you know that that repentance and faith was predicated, can I say that again? Predicated by God's choice of you. You did not choose me, I chose you. You love me, why? Because I love you first. God initiated this thing. And so we have this tension, maybe it's not a tension, that's not really the, the best word for it, because they don't, if you look at it, completely. They don't contradict one another, but you do have something, at least in our minds initially, it seems like a tension between God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. And Malachi takes us directly to God's sovereignty and salvation in his choice to save people. 
And I'm just going to say this. I, I said this at the beginning of our study of the book of Romans. This was, this, this, learning this and submitting to this doctrine was a massive breakthrough for me in my spiritual walk. Not because of election, but because it was me submitting to the Word of God. That this, this, this challenged me to say, do I really believe what's in this book? Or am I always going to find a way to wriggle free and step and sidestep and find a way out of and explain away? Or am I just going to believe what God says? And this was a huge challenge for me, and it changed my life, and it changed my whole trajectory in ministry, and changed my trajectory in just the way I approach Scripture and life. And I pray that it would do the same to you. If we simply read and believe what the Bible says, this can be one of the most joyful breakthroughs of your life. John Piper says this, the teaching of this text appears to some as dark and foreboding and unapproachable, but for others it brings a sense of awe and safety. There is a sense of trembling and speechlessness, for this is not like anything we have known. But inside the cloud, the sense of peace and safety is as firm as the mighty Everest and as deep as the ocean, space, and stars. My prayer is that you would discover this doctrine and find a completely sovereign God. This has implications, massive implications, and I would say massive implications of how you suffer, of how you think about suffering, massive implications of how you think about God's love which is what we're going to talk about today. Massive implications about how you think about how much God actually loves you. You will, if you capture this, you will become someone who sings louder on Sunday. You will be someone who is more ready to give the gospel to people because you know that's the way God saves his people. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. You know that the way God saves his elect is by giving them the gospel. And you want to be a part of this. And you join God's effort in bringing his family in. This is life-changing. And you can understand God's love, like I said, more and more. Well... That's what the people were asking. The people were asking about the nature of God's love. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, verse 2, how have you loved us? And they're asking a question, do you really love us, God? All those magnificent promises about the Messiah, about the end times, all these magnificent things. Lord, do you still love us? And so this passage talks about God's election, the doctrine of predestination, but it's all an explanation of how much God, in fact, loves us. So, let's understand, first of all, God's love and blessing. Verse 2, it says, how have you loved us? And then God responds by saying, is not Esau Jacob's brother? Stop right there. What's he saying? Well, you've got to answer that question, right? Is Jacob Esau's brother? Yes. In fact, they were twin brothers, came from the same parents. In fact, Esau, in terms of the human tradition of that day, Esau should have gotten the blessing. He should have been the one who was chosen, not Jacob. So what does this tell us about the love of God? What does this teach us about God's love? It teaches us, first of all, that his love is unconditional. God did not look to human tradition, or to something one of those boys had done. There's no indication here that, well, God was looking forward in time and saw how Jacob would respond. No. Jacob was a supplanter. The guy was a cheat. The guy was just as evil as Esau or Edom was. God did not base his decision on them. It was, came, came perfectly out of God's love. It came out of God's character, not Jacob's character. This was an unconditional choice, an unconditional love. God didn't say, I'll love you, I'll choose you, if. 
It's not what God says. It's not the doctrine of election. It certainly isn't the kind of doctrine that you want to embrace. If you, if you sort of tease this out and you're honest with yourself, if you believe that God bases his election of people on their choice of him by him looking forward in time, if you believe that, basically what you're saying is that everybody in heaven is in heaven because they're just a little bit better than everybody in hell. They make good choices. They're a little more spiritually inclined. It's not having anything to do with God's character and God's choice. This is what God is saying right here. My love for you was not because you were great. He says this to the people of Israel again and again, doesn't he? It's not because you're a great people, a mighty people, a people who can make war. I chose you because of my love and my great grace and my glory. That's what it says in Ephesians chapter 1. This was for the purpose of his grace, so that we would see his glory and worship him for it. This is an unconditional love. Now, this is shocking. People want to believe earnestly down deep inside. They want to believe in some way they earned God's love for them. No, God says, I want you to think about my love for you it was not because you were greater. It was, it was not because you had done anything or would do anything. It is simply on the basis of my own love and my kindness because it's an unconditional love. I just chose you for my own purposes. Uh, God's love is also a predestinating or predestining love. This love is a love that mapped out a plan for Jacob's life, right? God met with Jacob. God changed Jacob's name, saved him, made him the father of Israel from whom the Savior would come. God had his life mapped out. He had predestined him, and he'd worked all these things out. He had mapped this all out. The love that God has is that kind of love. When it says, later on we'll look at this in the Gospels, when it says, behold, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Is God saying he did not have intellectual capability of knowing them? No, he knew everything about them. What does he mean, I did not know you? This is the knowledge of intimacy. I did not choose you. I did not predestine you. I did not map out your life. I never knew you. I did not choose you before the foundation of the world. I never knew you. You are not one of my elect. Third thing this tells us about God's love is that his love is a free and sovereign love. I have loved Jacob. I have loved Jacob. I, out of my own sovereign choice. You know, people bend over backwards to defend freedom of the will, man's free will, and yet they cannot point to one verse that talks about how free man is prior to salvation. Because all those verses about what man is before salvation is that they are dead, they are slaves, they are in bondage, they are sick, they are leprous, they are uh, uh, slaves to sin, they're in bondage. People bend over backwards to talk about the sovereignty of man and the freedom of man's will and how God bows to this one greater thing than him, and that is the will of man. And yet no one ever talks about the sovereignty of God, the free will of God. That is something you see all through the pages of Scripture, right? That God is completely sovereign. Well, I can tell this has made some of you uncomfortable, so let me ease your pain a little bit by just digressing a moment. This is about the particular saving love that God has for his children, okay? This is not to say God does not also have a different kind of love for all the world, even for Esau. Okay, this passage doesn't cover it, but there is, such as John 3, 16, uh, such as the passages where Jesus has compassion on the crowds and looks at Jerusalem with compassion and weeps and there is a demonstration, a, a consistent demonstration throughout the Bible that God does have a general love for all people of all the world. But think of it this way. God's love is not one-dimensional. It's not monolithic. It is three-dimensional. Just like your love, only better. 
Let me ask you a, a, a question. Do you, you people in this room, do you love my girls? Of course you do. You guys all love my girls. Well, maybe some of you don't, but you would never tell me that. You love my children. I hope you love my children. I love your children. Do you love your children? You have a very profound electing, predestining, as best you can, as not a sovereign, but as best you can, love for your children, don't you? That you do not have for my children. You have a broad love, yes, for the children of our church, the children of the world. But you have a very specific love for your children. This is God and His people. He has a very specific love. This is not a discussion of God's general love for the world. This is in respect to His choice of salvation. Okay, so this is not saying in no sense, in any sense whatsoever, God has no love at all for Esau. Some Calvinists try to push this idea that God has only hatred and anger, and there is that there. That judgment is there, especially when it comes in terms of, we talk about salvation, but God does have, and He is capable of, a broad love for the whole world. So when it says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, I don't put in parentheses of the elect. I believe God does have a moral will that all come to repentance and not perish. But he also has a sovereign will. And a sovereign will, in his sovereign plan, he chooses people. And here is the example of this choice. He loves Jacob. He hates Esau. Well, let's talk about hatred, God's hatred, and God's judgment. The key to understanding this hatred and judgment is verses 3 and 4. But Esau, I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Edom says we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says they may build, but I will tear down and they will be called the wicked country and the people whom, with whom the Lord is angry forever. So what does it say? I think it says three things again. God rejects and opposes them. I have laid waste the hill country. This here, in this picture for you, is a picture of Edom. See any skyscrapers? Luscious trees anywhere? This is what Edom looks like now. Anybody know an Edomite? No. They're gone. God has judged them. So God, this hatred means God rejects them and opposes them. They are at, at enmity with God. And there is, in terms of salvation, not in terms of the broad love, but in terms of salvation, he intends to judge them. These are what Romans 9 talks about, vessels created for destruction. God creates people so that he can display his judgment against their sin. That's what this is saying. I know that's a hard thing to swallow. We want to think that God is this grandpa that just is sort of hoping that everybody would respond but God must demonstrate his judgment. Now, you put an asterisk on this because God does not judge them because of his choice not to save them. He judges them for their sin. Did you see what it says? It'll say of them, the wicked country. How does God judge the non-elect? He drags them kicking and screaming against their will into sin? No. Just gives them what they want. He just gives them exactly what they want. God does not work and will in the life of an unbeliever as if they are this neutral person in respect to God. And he works in some people's lives to love him, and he works in some people's lives to despise God and reject God. That is not how election works. All of humanity is at enmity with God, and then God comes along and saves his elect and works in them for good, and then leaves the others to have what they want. This is Romans chapter 1. He gives them over. Gives them over to what? Their desires. We talked a little about it in the early class uh, about Pharaoh. It even says God hardened Pharaoh's heart, but what happened before that? Pharaoh hardened his heart. It's what he wanted. 
You want to serve God. I want to love God. So when God, when you think about these sort of two paths of predestination, these two paths of election, electing some vessels for glory and some vessels for destruction, it's not as though this person is just sort of neutral, carrying on, and God just, you know, sort of unfairly comes along and says, well, I've just decided just sort of capriciously that you're going to be a vessel for destruction. No, he lets them do exactly what they want, and he will judge them for doing the very things that they desire to do. He gives them what they want. Parents, we've done this with our children, not judge them eternally, but we've done something like this, right? When you know, you've told them, you shouldn't do that. It's going to give you a tummy ache. You shouldn't do that. If you wait, uh, my daughters, as they get older, uh, my oldest daughter, she takes classes to a university online. I tell her, if you wait until the last minute to do that paper, won't do good on it. The first few times we help her get it done. And then finally comes a point where we say, okay, I, we're going to give you to, over to your own devices. And then she comes back to us in pleading and humility the night before, please help me with my paper. And Becky always stays up and helps her. We understand this is, fair. this is not an issue of whether or not God is fair or not fair. Humanity stands at enmity with God. And it is, it is but by the grace of God go we. It is simply because He has gotten in us and changed us. If He doesn't do that, it's not that we're neutral with God. We remain as enemies of God pursuing the desires that we've always had and always will have. God just gives us over. So, God gives them over what they want. Another thing about his hatred is that this lasts forever. The people with whom the Lord is angry forever, it says. This has eternal consequences. This has eternal consequences. Now, how do we respond to the doctrine of election? I've suggested some things already, but thinking of Malachi and his people at that time, how should the people respond? I think we respond, first of all, in humility. I think that, at least for me, that was the biggest thing for me at finally relenting and saying, okay, I understand that humans are responsible, but I also understand now God is sovereign. The big part of me that I needed to do is to find humility. Now, again, sometimes people want to explain this whole salvation situation as though God does everything except for that one little decision, but it isn't just one little decision. It is a massive decision. It is a decision that, according to Scripture, you and I cannot make without the Holy Spirit regenerating first our hearts. So so if you just say, well, God does everything except for the one decision, well, basically you're saying is God leaves me to do the most important thing in terms of my salvation. No. If God left you to do the one most important thing of salvation, guess what? We would, none of us would do it. If God left that choice to us without his influence, without his change, without the regenerating of our hearts, if God left that to us, let me tell you something, none of us would do it. We would continue on in rebellion against God. Now, God does this, and as we think about God doing this for us, as we think about God coming into our hearts and changing us and regenerating our hearts and giving us new eyes and helping us see our sin and understanding salvation, this is a humiliating truth that though God uses man's responsibility and evangelism and prayer and praying parents and, and churches and the means of grace, and though God uses all these things, ultimately, behind it all, it is God and God alone who saves you. And you cannot take one ounce of credit. This is a humiliating doctrine. And so our response to this is, should, be, should be in humility. You think about the people in Malachi's day? And God is preaching through Malachi saying, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. They ought to be suddenly, instantaneously broken. We're not some special race 
some kind of special genetics and we're just sort of better than others and making better choices. No, God might as well chose Esau and Edom, but instead He chose us. And it's a humbling doctrine. It's also a doctrine that should cause in us reverence and fear of God. This ought to make us realize that God is mighty and strong and we ought to fear Him. This ought to also work in us a gratitude, like I said, as we come on Sunday morning of all people, we ought to be singing louder than anybody. This ought to make us sing loudly, which brings me to the last point. This ought to inspire worship. And when I say worship, I don't just mean praise on Sunday morning. Everything that worship means. Praising God with our lives, our obedience, our attitudes. Lord, you did not save me on the basis of me being better or me making better choices or me, you know, being at the right place at the right time. You chose me based sheerly and only upon your good character. And for that, I worship you. All of us, for Christians, we can map back. Maybe we can't, but maybe we, we, we can sort of in our imaginations map back when our families came into the kingdom. Maybe you're the first generation. Maybe you're uh, like my generation. My family is like, this is like the fifth or sixth generation of Christians and a lot of them being pastors. But there was a time when there was a bunch of elephs that moved from Wales to Tennessee in the 1700s, and these people were not Christians. They were rebellious cowboys. A lot of them were um, involved in, uh, like, uh, police work. The first sheriff of London or one of the sheriffs of London, when they first started issuing last names for tax purposes, his last name was Eliph. We were gun-toting, rebellious people. Go back before that, what were the Welsh people doing? I always like to say, running around naked, worshiping false gods. Probably most of your ancestors were doing the same. And you think about what it took, the predestinating power of God, to work all this so that you would hear and understand, and your heart would be open to the gospel. Whew. What an amazing God. What, a, what an astonishing God. Should I not now then live in total and, and objectively clear worship of God the rest of my life? An amazing application. This is what Malachi and God behind Malachi wanted the people of Israel to do, to be shocked and amazed at the graciousness and kindness of God. Not of their choices, not of their good decisions, but of God's grace, which is sheerly and the only reason that they were chosen, the love of God. Well, we know this because we see verse 5 there, your own eyes shall see this and you shall say, great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. He's Thinking about beyond Israel, because you're talking about Edom now, which is the descendants of Esau. This is a different part of the world, you know, near Israel, but looking over all the earth. This gives the people a worldview, doesn't it? It gives them a, a picture of God's sovereignty. And like I said, this comes to play in terms of your suffering, in terms of this world, in terms of your look to the future, in terms of your hopes, in terms of your desires and dreams and prayers, in terms of your uh, uh, evangelism. You want to be a part of what God is doing? You know that faithful people who listened to the Great Commission came to you. And that's how God saved you. And that's how God saved you, His child. And you want to see other of His children come into the kingdom. And so you, in turn, do the same thing. You don't need, in terms of evangelism, you don't need someone's salvation to be dependent on you and your faithfulness. You need it to be dependent on God's plan and God's sovereignty. And so your being a part of His mission is not uh, something that determines the eternity of others, but it is an attitude of worship and gratefulness that you say you are a great God and you save people and you can use me in your saving of other people.
Isn't that good? We worship God for these things. All right, I wanted to leave a couple of minutes. We just have about three or four minutes. Um, maybe I'm opening myself up for a great disaster. And I figured I'd let you guys ask any kind of questions that you might have, because this is a difficult doctrine to swallow, especially if you're fairly new to it. It's difficult to swallow. And I just want to say, our church, we are, um, yeah, we have our beliefs, and the elders believe things, and we have our statement of faith, and it makes clear these things, and makes these things under, hopefully understandable. But we're also, we know that people struggle with things, and battle through things, and learn things, just like I did. And so, don't think that we have this very narrow idea of everyone here has to be a little five-point Calvinist and everyone has to have the same, you know, use the same exact Bible or whatever. Um, we're okay with people struggling with this and, you know, trying to work their way through it. Uh, in that sense, anybody have any questions or thoughts? Maybe throw that out there. I taught election so perfectly that not one person... No, I'm sure some of you are going to go home and lose some sleep over this, as I did. Well, let's have a word of prayer, and uh, Jonathan will close us then. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for even these doctrines that are hard to understand, but Lord, we submit to them. We thank you for them. We know that they are given to us so that we can worship you, and worship you we will. Lord, we know that we don't know who the elect are. We don't know who your children are. And so we scatter the seed on all the soils, hoping and praying that somehow you will use that effort to save your children and to build your kingdom. Lord, we know that others did that for us who were ahead of us, and other people did it for them, and other people did it for them going all the way back to the time that your own son was on this earth. And the disciples and others began to spread the truth of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we know that that takes a, an act of incredible providence, an amazing sovereign act of you predestinating us to salvation. So we thank you for that. We do not uh, want to browbeat Christians who struggle with these things. And we don't seek to fight with those in other churches who believe differently. But we do believe this is a truth and this is a belief that is given to us in Scripture. And so we believe it and we believe it enhances our worship, it enhances our evangelism, it enhances everything that we live for and that is for your glory. Help us do that. It's in your name we pray. 